All right, everyone. Welcome to the very first episode of Better Red Than Dead. I am your fairly well-known host, Panther, and we have two other animal types with us. Uh, so you all can go ahead and introduce yourselves. Um, I suppose I'll go first. Um, I am a fish. Um, I also live um, in, well, I guess I, I, live, I live nearby. Um, I'm a Maoist myself. I, uh, I'm a proletarian. I work in a grocery store. Um, and I'm transgender. I th think that pretty much covers it for me. I'm Brooke, and I'm a filthy prole. All right, so we've got a, I don't even know what class I am. I guess some sort of intellectuals on a class. So I don't know. I guess I'm just me. And we have two filthy white proletarians. So they are here to make their penance to the revolutionary proletariat of the United States of which they're a part. Well, how can you make penance or something of which you are a part? I don't know. Have you all done anything bad? I definitely have done some bad things. I think most people have. Um, but nothing I would say that I need to pay penance for. Yeah. And Rook, I'm fairly certain, has done all sorts of horrible things in their lifetime. Absolutely. So they're here to make their penance to the proletariat. So um, I guess the, why did we choose to start this project? Well, I've been doing videos, podcasts, stuff like that for a while. But the thing is, if you don't do this sort of thing in a collaborative, collectivist fashion, because we are communists, if you don't do this stuff collectively, then what is it going to end up being? It's going to end up being basically an individualist vanity project, right? And um, I decided that, yeah, that's not going to be very good. I'm not doing this for my own personal aggrandizement. I'm doing this to help uh, inspire and motivate people to um, to actually get out and start organizing, to actually get out and start doing stuff to make this communist project a reality uh, somewhere outside of the heads of, I don't know. How many, how many communists, like real communists, do we reckon are in the United States? Like, I'm not talking like, oh, I share a meme on the internet. I mean, like re actual real communists that are actually doing shit. Like, how many of those do we think that there are in the United States? Well, I mean, I, I go ahead. It depends on like what you mean as like communist, like uh, a sympathizer, or like someone who, someone who is organized, like in the work of organizing and professes to be a communist, whether that be like ML or whatever. No, I mean like actual Marxist, Leninist, Maoist, communist, because. I know this is going to sound very sectarian, but you're not a Maoist. I mean, you're not a communist unless you are a Maoist because to promote modern revisionism, ML revisionism, or uh, whatever are these other uh, ideological fetishes that people have constructed in their own brains, when you promote stuff like that, you are really setting the proletarian revolutionary movement back because you are depriving them of 150 years of analysis and uh, you're basically spitting on the blood of millions of people who have died for the realization of this ideology and the inculcation of it into practice. So that's what I mean by, uh, by communist. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would go one further and say, you know, um, even if you're a Maoist, like you're not a communist, if you're not like actively engaged in organizing for revolution like it's, it's not enough just to know theory just to like be familiar with communists um you know there's there's something we call that it's a, a communist sympathizer yeah um, some, right um someone who someone who intellectually understands communism but it's not engaged uh, organizationally it's not 
practically speaking, a communist. And in terms of actual communists that are in the United States, I would say that, um, I would say less than 100. In fact, I'd probably say less than 50, honestly. Oh, you are ever the pessimist, aren't you, Fish? <laughs> when you were but um, I, I think that the ones that we do have are very valuable, and um, hopefully we can drive that number up in the coming uh, months and years. So Fish says that the number of real communists in the United States is uh, not enough to fill the bleachers at a high school basketball game in in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska. What do you say, Rook? How many communists are there in the United States? I'm not entirely sure how to answer that question, honestly. Like, I would err on the side of it being a low number. And it's like, like no, I guess a hundred or less. I, I would have before, to agree with Fish. I guess before next week, uh, one of us has to go out and conduct a census. You have to go out and physically conduct a survey of every three hundred of all three hundred and twenty-five million people in the United States, and uh, come back come back with the real number. But yeah, I will be right on that. I'd probably say it's around five hundred, but I'm more of an optimist. All right. So, yeah, my goal, our goal, rather, I need to get out of the habit of saying my, because I have co-hosts now, and my co-hosts probably wouldn't appreciate it if I kept saying I. Uh, Our goal with this project is to actually start inspiring people to get off their asses and start doing communist shit. So what is communist shit, yo? Um, I guess uh, agitation at work, propaganda, all kinds of stuff. Go ahead, Fish. Yeah, I would say um, participating in a communist organization, a revolutionary communist organization, um, and going out among the masses and um, participating in their struggles, helping them get organized. Uh, like uh, like Rook said, um, you know, tenant organizing. Um, uh, labor organizing, like there's lots, there's lots of ways of expressing that. Um, but ultimately, yeah, it's, uh, it's furthering the revolution by working with the masses and, um, organizing them as a part of them. Yeah. That's the thing that a lot of people, uh, a lot of people fuck up. Like they think that they are above the masses or there's some organism divorced from the masses. And that lays the foundations for, uh, Our collective has been studying a book written by a guy named Scott Harris, and he's a uh, former member of the Revolutionary Communist Party USA, uh, which we consider a revisionist formation. But uh, he turned into a real Maoist as a result of studying and leaving the revisionist organization that he was previously a member of. Anyways, uh, we found out about how um, about how the mass line could be distorted. And that distortion, when you dist- when you divorce yourself from the masses, that lays the foundations for what we call a uh, a left opportunist um, distortion of the mass line, right? So when we say left opportunism, what do we mean by that? Um, I guess I guess I'll go ahead and go. Um, yeah, left opportunism. It's um, sacrificing your principles and pushing too hard for um, pu- pu- pushing for things that the masses aren't ready to do. Basically, it is it is characterized by like uh, small sects that do like extreme actions on their own without engaging with the masses. Um, basically. The principle that you're sacrificing um, that makes it opportunism is the principle of putting the masses first and that the masses are the makers of history. Instead of trying to um, meet the masses where they're at, instead um, you become detached from them um, by, by, being, by under, trying to undertake actions that they're not ready for, you, basically. Yeah, you um, instead of the masses making history, you become convinced that it is my very small group that makes history. 
we've already talked about how many communists we think there are in the United States, right? So what percentage, uh, Rook and Fish said around 50 real communists in the United States. I'm going to be generous to say 500. Okay, the population of the United States is what, 325 million people? So what percentage of that is communists uh, by our reckoning? Let me do some quick math. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say math is never my strong suit. 50 into 325, zero, 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 zero. That is... Shocking that the public school system failed me. That is point <laughs> zero 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 one five four percent So a, a, a laughably minuscule percentage of... Um, of the population we define as real communists. So it is obvious. What about, what about people that are sympathizers, right? Potential, potential revolutionaries, right? Oh, well, that's the point of us doing this, uh, doing this to help turn some of them, to convince them of the, uh, of the urgency of organizing seriously for the development of the socialist order, right? For the conquest of the socialist order, right? We are Maoists, so we always have to use militaristic language for whatever reason. So for the conquest of the socialist order, that's why we're here. But uh, sympathizers, uh, I don't know. Do we consider Bernie people sympathizers? Do we consider uh, the Justice Democrats or uh, any of those types? Like people who are who may be well-meaning, right? They want, um, they want free health care. They want free education. They want the police to sh stop shooting people just because they're new African. Uh, they think that it's a horrible thing that 56 uh, migrants uh, were left in a truck to die because of our horrible immigration laws. They think that these are all bad things. They think that, um, they think that a better way is possible, but they're sympathizers because they don't believe in armed struggle. They think that that is ridiculous, a ridiculous proposition, uh, either ideologically or tactically or strategically, whatever. Or um, they think that Mao was a uh, dictator. Of course, just because we call ourselves Maoists, just because we are Maoists, that does not mean that we believe that everything that Mao Zedong did in China was 100% uh, good because he did do some pretty stupid shit. And... Part of being, yes, the, the naming convention doesn't really do us any favors. That is true. Like, uh, like I've had it, uh, I've got into it, not necessarily got into it, but I've had uh, some pretty intense struggles with uh, new African nationalists who are like, why are you calling yourself after this Chinese dude? And then you've got Marx and Lenin, two European dudes. So where's the black people at? And um, that's a very, like, that's a very cogent and, uh, an understandable argument. Like, if we are going to support new African national liberation, why would we uh, say that new African people, the Chicano people, they have to unite 100% with the ideologies of people who do not belong to their nations? For example, I think that Mao's position on the uh, new African national question that basically held that all we have to do is unite with the white working class in the United States, and it was only a small percentage of white people who were actually participating in our ex exploitation and oppression. I find that uh, it's divorced from the actual concrete conditions of this country. Mao had never been to the United States. I think Ho Chi Minh, who actually had been to the United States, he attended Marcus Garvey speeches, and he lived in Harlem for years. I think his position on the question was more uh, was was better because he actually had experience in our struggle. He actually came to our, he actually came to this country and he lived among us. Mao, if I recall correctly, uh, he did visit the Soviet Union, but he was not a world traveler. Uh, Ho Chi Minh was. Um, so, I mean, we have to, yeah, I think you're right. The name of convention um, isn't, it's not necessarily not doing us any favors because when we explain what Maoism is to people, if we do it correctly, they understand that it's not just everything that Mao Zedong ever said or did. And we obviously don't believe in the whole great leader bullshit. 
But on the other hand, like, what's wrong with calling yourself a revolutionary communist? What's wrong with calling yourself a scientific socialist? Like, why are we so caught up on names and personalities? It's like, it's like, it's like those Christians that become so caught up on what their pastor says or, or what their favorite theologian says, and they do not ever allow any deviation from what this person said. That's book worship. And if I recall correctly, uh, the guy, the OG, actually wrote a piece called Opposed Book Worship, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I would say that the um, the name, it, it, it's really more technical than anything. And, and like like Rook said, that doesn't do us any favors because, you know, we have a, um, a technical name that uh, requires explaining to anyone that you present it to. Um, it would be easier if we called it revolutionary, um, revolutionary communism or the revolutionary science or something like that. But the issue is that um, uh, Maoism, you know, it doesn't come from nowhere. It's not just an idea that we just came up with one day that's the best idea, right? Um, it comes from historical struggles for socialism. And um, the, you know, the full name is Marxism, Leninism, Maoism. And it's because each one of those names represents a, a, a crucial step in the development of this ideology. So if we called it revolutionary communism today, um, but then we had like this very big uh, rupture in the future where we, we learned um, some new things like enough, enough to totally overturn our current understanding. Um, what would we call it then? Would, <laughs> we'd have to think of a new name. Like the, the name represents a development on the previous iterations of revolutionary communism. So while they were all revolutionary communism, Maoism basically just kind of uh, puts a little earmark on the particular stage of understanding that we are currently in uh, with revolutionary communism. So um, maybe we could think of another name for it, but especially considering how many Maoists there are in the United, not, not in the United States, in the world, um, I don't think we would be doing ourselves any favors by um, detaching ourselves from that global struggle um, that we share with other Maoists as well. So it's kind of a tricky situation um, having a name that is um, tricky to deal with, but uh, ultimately does uh, represent our theoretical understanding. Of course, this is all within the context of America where like we are like on the, it, like in the middle of like decades of a like psychological campaign <laughs> through media and all sorts of other institutions to demonize any sort of like alternative to capitalism like it's ingrained into american culture it's almost yeah. crystallized at this point yeah it brings it brings us back to the uh to the quote from uh from masada Shakur's uh autobiography where she said that people are taught to hate the communists and uh that only a fool would allow would allow their enemy to tell them who their enemy is right so we're not necessarily saying that all Americans are fools, but we're saying that if you are bombarded with something, for example, say we weren't all communists, okay? Um, where would our image of communists come from? Uh, those horrible movies that came out in the 80s, Rambo, Red Dawn, uh, Rocky, like communists are automatons, right? We're supposed to be robots. There's no... Uh, there's no way that you can contradict uh, this a horrible authoritarian system, right? Uh, we're then in high school. What book do we read? 1984, right? Which is uh, basically George Orwell, uh, George Orwell's caricature of what we could call a, a Stalinist society, right? 24-7 surveillance. You cannot think outside of a you cannot think outside of the so-called box. Well, actually, the proletarians, because they were seen as being so little of a threat in Orwell's uh, novel, they were allowed more freedom than outer party members. Like uh, the guy in the book, uh, the main character, Smith, he was allowed to, uh, to basically do nothing, right? All of his thoughts were monitored. He couldn't do shit. Whereas the proletarians, they had this constant 
um, bombardment of pro, what they call pro feed, which is uh, basically smut, porn, uh, crappy songs, basically the stuff you can listen to on the radio today, right? That was called pro feed. But when you were in the party, outer party and inner party members, they had very little restrict. They had very little uh, ability to do whatever. So that's what mo- the majority of Americans think communism is. So it's up to us to one create countercultural institutions to educate the people on what socialism and communism really are, and two not feed into that myth right by uh, by allowing our organizations to turn into petty dictatorships, right? Yeah, right. I mean, that, that's, that's kind of our goal. Um, we, don't, we don't just want to reach communists or, or, or communist sympathizers, since you made the distinction. Um, really, like, uh, the re- rehabilitation of the image of communism is, like, one of our major goals, because, um, and, you know, as Brooke said, like, there's, there's years and years, I think, I think just about over a hundred years of like red scare um propaganda that's been that's been going around ingrained in people's minds um and you know so so talking to regular people who don't really understand communism like if you if you say the words communism or socialism proletariat or um stall in the soviet union like it, it just throws up all these red flags and they, they just don't want to listen to you anymore so you know you have to find uh creative ways to kind of dance around the, uh, the subject and explain it in terms that aren't associated with all those bad words. Um, but ultimately, like, we want to make those good words. <laughs> we want to um, make it so that when people hear communists, they think of someone who, who is there for them, someone who will back them up when they need it. Um, so yeah, I think, I think, you know, it's up to us to prove um, in our work that we are serious about what we believe and that we're willing to put in the work to make it a reality. Like comrade Nino Brown said, money, or in our case, action, talks. Bullshit runs a marathon. I don't know if either of you have ever seen New Jack City. Maybe we can do a collective screening of it. Uh, Yeah, it's... um, I, I, I haven't seen it. It's not really kind of the kind of movie that I watch. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's a quintessential hood film. Very good. You all need to become more you all need to become more aware of new African culture. Um anyways, uh, let's talk about some news. Let's see. Fallout from the Roe v. Wade decision, right? So I read this uh, this article. It says that this lady that lived in uh, northern Texas, she made a um, she made a pretty hostile. Understandably, she was upset, right? She was fucking pissed. She had had an essential right that she had become used to uh, stripped away and with a stroke of a pen from a from nine black bagged assholes in D.C. Uh, so she was pissed and she went on Facebook as Americans tend to do and made a, uh, made a pretty hostile post. And, uh, she got a visit from the department of Homeland security and they sent her a letter, a nasty letter saying, if you do this again, you may be arrested. So first of all, so much for the first amendment, right? And then second of all, like that sort of gives the lie to the myth that, um, that, that's sort of like the, the internet is not a free marketplace of ideas. No, like you cannot say whatever you want. Like you're going to be policed. You're going to be harassed. You're going to be hounded. If you say things that diverge from the mainstream American uh, body politics point of view, like, okay, the mainstream Democrats, they're like, okay, Roe was on the ballot. Meantime, that fellow Joe Biden up in the white house, he just appointed a Republican anti-abortion uh, individual as a federal judge, and these people serve for life. So from the perspective of the average American, judges have more impact over their lives. Like they can write a decision that can impact your life and fuck you up for the rest of your life, right? Your congressman really doesn't have that much impact because your congressman don't do shit. And the president, he's uh, 
grand poobah sitting up in the White House somewhere. So uh, they paid this lady a visit, and uh, she she's probably having some uh, some second thoughts about a lot of things. But what do we think about that? Like Roe v. Wade has been overturned. This is a decision that most of us have lived with. Like we, those of us uh, in this country have grown up under the belief that abortion, even though some people may hate it, it is a, it's a right, right? But now it isn't anymore. So how do we process that? I mean, ultimately I understand it as like, rights are enforced. They have to be enforced for them to mean anything. Right. And, if there is no the like whatever centralized authority you're under the whim to uh can just strip that away from you at any time if it if it wants to so like all of all of these judges all of the courts they don't exist to serve people or or uh uh, a collective in any sort of way it exists to interpret law in a way that benefits essentially property owners and i mean if we look at the history of the united states like have the working class people uh, ever had any power in this country like there was Not, there, like was there ever a time that we can look back on and say okay this was a good time for the average person. Well, I mean, if you want to put it that way, like um, the United States enjoyed a, a particular prosperity in like the, the post-World War II period. Like um, not everyone um, had, it, had it really well, but I would say the majority of United States citizens um, enjoyed some kind of prosperity. Now, of course, that was built on the backs of millions and millions of uh, poor and and suffering people in, in East Asia and in Africa and Latin America like um, so you could say that that there, there have been periods of relative prosperity but in terms of like has the working class ever really had power not really I mean the unions have been more or less strong um, throughout the years um, you know you had the the union busting efforts in the 80s and like we're still trying to kind of recover from that um but even when the unions were still very strong uh no i don't i don't think the working class really ever had real political power um all they had was you know relative positions of leverage to beg for scraps you know it's um i think i think the concept in a lot of ways is just completely foreign to american workers um personally I don't think workers particularly have power. They have bribes. Yeah, so it's like, okay, uh, you're not going to ever have control over your means of production. You're not going to ever be in a position to where uh, you could tell your boss what to do. But but you can we'll, have a house. Yeah, we'll let you have a house. Oh, we'll let you, you can have live a, by a lake or something, or I'm you're, you're you're you can live in a person. in a in a in a neighborhood where the the backyard is a fucking nine hole golf course. <laughs> I've never known any working class person who lives like that though. You're talking about the petty bourgeoisie. But that's the that's the that's the idea at least. Yeah, that's the idea. That's the that's the goal. Like, right? I've never you known just get those things and you won't feel empty inside. Like I've never known a janitor that owns a fucking boat. <laughs> you don't know many fishermen. <laughs> I see I stay away from water I don't know how to swim um, you go fishing Rook I mean I will my dad used to fish and oh. something that I I kind of like enjoy to do it's just like uh, mostly doing nothing right yeah, standing around waiting for something to bite the hook right exactly yeah, I want to fish. I've been fishing two times. It's, it just it just hits me as the most in, indescribably boring sport. 
Like, I don't see how, like, there's a, there's a fishy channel on TV. Like, why would you just turn the TV on to see some old motherfucker in the backwoods somewhere and he's throwing a line out and then he's just standing there? Well, see, fish, watching fishing and actually fishing are two different things. Yeah, I know, but I, I just, I just get, I just get to find it hilarious. Like some people can actually sit and, and watch somebody else go fishing, live vicariously through the TV. Oh man! All right, so yeah, Roe v. Wade. Your rights are not guaranteed, people. They only come through what? Voting. Yeah, <laughs> voting yeah, goes here. I'd say um, fierce political struggle, like not necessarily armed struggle. I mean, ultimately, armed struggle is the deciding factor. Um, but historically, you know, armed struggle has complemented many um, uh, movements for civil rights and things like that. But um, a lot of times, um, well, it's a response, right? Like people yeah. demand what they're owed, and the state says no. And then the people demand what they're owed, and then it just keeps escalating until either mm -hmm. people have power or the uh, revolution fails, so to speak. Like, um, like you know, pointing pointing to the civil rights movement. Um, there certainly were. Um, parts of the civil rights movement that were conducting armed struggle. You know, you had the, uh, the, the Black Panthers. Um, you, you had a lot of different uh, organizations that were either engaging in armed struggle or were preparing to engage in armed struggle. And, you know, that they certainly played a large factor. Um, but I would say the, the change came from the millions and millions of regular people who sort of went on board with their program, like, um, uh, again, you know, pointing to the masses as the makers of history, like ultimately it was the masses themselves and the masses by and large were not harmed. Um, now, that's not to say that they shouldn't be, um, but again, going back to like moving too far ahead of the masses and things like that, left opportunism, um, it's something that you build up to. So. Uh, armed struggle is um, the goal, but it's not always appropriate. Um, well, I wouldn't so I would necessarily say, call it a goal, but it's just a more like an inevitable reality of. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, because because they're going to bring force of arms against the revolution, yeah, they, right? They, yeah, exactly. They will do whatever to right, right. maintain the, their 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 position, their hegemony. But so I, I, I would say that these, these rights, these concessions, um, what, what does them um, is, is struggle, armed or not. It is um, demanding that, that these things be taken seriously and not letting them ignore it. I'm not about y'all, but I'm not taking part in the armed struggle. I'm full for Michelle Obama. <laughs> Michelle Obama will save us all. All right, so uh, Akron, Ohio, a kid named Jalen Walker. He was a DoorDash driver. Police shot him 60 times and handcuffed his corpse. Hear about that? No, oh, oh my God, that sounds I awful. I did. Fucking what? absurdity. Uh, is it, though? I mean, an absurdity is something that's divorce. Is that is it the norm, right? Like, for example, if you were if you're walking down the street, I, well, yeah, I, yeah, I I get what you're saying, like but it's down. it's just so. It's just vile. It's vile. You all know that when they did lynchings back in the day, they used to bring their kids. Like they they make a picnic out of it. Uh, mm -hmm. They would bring their kids. They had like little picnic baskets, and they'd sit down and they'd eat. And they had little kids eat while his body was swaying like 20 feet away from him. You could smell them burning. Because usually when they lynched you, they'd set you on fire. So you're just sitting eating, enjoying your buttermilk, buttermilk biscuits and fried chicken to the smell of burning flesh. Ain't that wild? That was an American hobby. 
for years. Yeah. I, I don't know. The, the the mindset is just too alien to me. I, I, I can't understand it even when I try. That's because you're a good person, Fish. <laughs> Most white Americans were not good people. Yeah. So, yeah. Like, I, I, I just don't know. Like, is it like a a wave effect, like one cop starts shooting and then everybody starts shooting? I mean, that's that's definitely true. Like, that, that's a documented fact. Um, in just about any situation where shooting is going to be involved, once it starts, um, pretty much it keeps going until people run out of ammo, or at least at least uh, run out of ammo in their, in their magazine. Um, I, I, I think... What was, the, what was the point of putting the handcuffs on the dead body for? Like, he's not going... Yeah. There. No, I don't, I don't know. And, and especially, like, um, cops have a habit of shooting people and then not letting uh, medical responders uh, treat them until it's, until it's too late now. With the amount of times that this person was shot, like, there, I doubt there's anything that could yeah, be done even at that the, point. They shot the dude 60 fucking times. There's nothing that EMS or any, anybody... Right. And, and, and so, like you said, I, I don't understand why, why you would handcuff the corpse. I mean, uh, maybe that's in their protocol. For some reason, I don't understand it. What do you think, Rook? Why would you handcuff a corpse? Literally, none other than some sort of like malicious reason, like or or like a bureaucratic like reason, up, like fucked up sadism, like like handcuffing a corpse. Like I don't see like protocol being handcuffing a fucking corpse. That's well, they wouldn't. They wouldn't necessarily have confirmed that he's dead at that point. I mean, the EUA would probably assume that he was dead if he got shot in his fucking face. But um, it may be that they just handcuff anyone who's uh, who's a suspect on the ground, um, and then you know check and see if they're still breathing after. Well, if you're still breathing after getting shot sixty times, then they need to fucking they need to do some experiments on you. But um. Uh, and the police out there, like, <clears throat> they were sitting on this body cam video for, for days, and, you know, doctoring it, doing whatever. And it came out, it was still horrible. Like, that's how fucked up the situation was. Like, they were literally afraid that if they didn't sit on this for a few days, they were going to have riots out there in Africa. And it came out, it's still horrible. I haven't seen it, but I've been, like, reading accounts from people who have. I watched that, uh, that fucking... Yahoo shooting up that grocery store in Buffalo uh, <laughs> last month. And that was enough violence for me. I, I don't purposefully expose myself to that type of shit. But, uh... Yeah, I'll take a pass on all that. But yeah, it's fucking horrible. Like, how do you, like... And people are talking about defunding the police. Like, how do you... Okay. Like, like first of all, the police are a very, very powerful institution, right? They vote. Uh, politicians cater to them. So why would, how, how exactly is that going to work? I can understand if you're in a so-called progressive city like Minneapolis, which still has to defund the police, but like in our city, St. Louis, right? Or KC or Atlanta. And if you go into these neighborhoods, these working class black neighborhoods, most people they are like, okay, you want to defund the police. Now who's going to stop these louts from breaking into my house? or stealing my car, or robbing me on my way to work. So there's levels to this shit. We, it's all well and good to talk about defunding the police, but if we don't have any institution to actually, or, or structure to actually help solve the very, very real issue of crime in New African, Chicano, working class, white communities, then what the fuck? We're just, we're just spilling it out hot air, right? People are still gonna want the police around because we don't have anything different. Right, there is like a role that they're supposed to fulfill, but that's not what they do. No, nah, they're they just, just killing people. Yeah, they just protect uh, property and then enforce like racial white, suprem white supremacist law. Like, and it's hard, and it's and it's impossible to not characterize it as that when it affects. Uh, non-white people the way it does. Yeah, and um, I, I, I would emphasize here that um, 
it's part of, part of why dual power is so important because like we can't we can't really get rid of the state and and police and the and the roles that they um, serve in our current society without building an alternative to replace them. Um, if you like in the case of the police, for instance, uh, you, you could defund them, but but like you said, you know, there's still going to be um, people that getting their getting things stolen. Um, there's still going to be murders. Um, and if people don't feel like there's something that can be done about it, they're, they're not going to be um, encouraged to, to remove the, the system that is in place currently. So we have to have an alternative to present um, something that's rooted in the people themselves, as opposed to this uh, white supremacist settler society. In the third world, where the police are even more corrupt and shitty than they are here, they, um, when people don't trust the police, you know who they hire? Mercenaries, gangs. Like uh, during the uh, Civil War in Sierra, Lo Sierra, Sierra Leone back in the uh, 90s, if you watched Blood Diamond, uh, I'm pretty sure you, somewhat familiar, even though know, it was a fictionalized portrayal. And um, they hired this group because their army was getting cut to pieces by the RUF. So they hired this group run by literal ex-apartheid South African soldiers called Executive Outcomes. There were a few stray Rhodesians in there as well, but they literally hired this group of, uh, of assholes who murdered God knows how many African revolutionaries to come police the country because they couldn't do it. The army was too busy defecting or getting slaughtered, so they had to hire the fucking Boers to come patrol their country. And then while so if you defund the police, people are still going to have the need or the desire for safety and security. And if the left, if the communists can't provide it, they're going to turn to somebody else. And that somebody is probably going to be pretty shitty. Power and vacuum. Not, and also they're classic, not bound by Classic power vacuum. Yeah. And when power vacuums happen, who tends to take over? The people with the most correct ideas? No. Who takes over? And it's the people with the most uh, soldiers and guns. Exactly. So it would behoove us to make sure that the people with the most soldiers and guns are who? That'd be us, or, or at least um, uh, the revolutionary uh, movement, the, oh, the that, people. Us. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay, us, us specifically, us three. <laughs> Only yep. us. Yeah, we're, we're the triumvirate of warlords. We'll be safe on top of the pile of ordnance that totally won't blow up. Yeah. All right. So that's pretty much it for the major news that caught my attention this week. Is there any other news that got you guys' attention? What's going on in our fucked up world? Well, I mean, a whole lot of stuff. <laughs> Yeah, it a whole just, lot of uh, stuff. Yeah, what the the Supreme Court just uh, reduced, uh, like the ability for like the EPA to be enforced or some shit like that. Like, just whatever. Which just start fucking dumping used oil into your fucking yard. Mm, yummy. You can yeah, have a they. Uh, you have a fish fry. <laughs> I take I take offense to that. Um. But yeah, uh, they also they also um, what they they said that you can pray at high school sporting events. Um, you lead lead kids in prayer, right, 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 right. Which I mean, it, it, on the surface, it doesn't sound that offensive, but the if you look at the the context, um, it, it's part of like this crusade to like establish a Christian theocracy, basically. Um, Absolutely, it's a bunch of it's a it's undoing a bunch of shit, right? And that's where I see like um, right now the Supreme Court um, and, and and for the foreseeable future because like, I don't think any of these people are ready to die or retire. Um, they're, they're kind of using the Supreme Court um, as this uh, weapon as a as an instrument to sort of 
um, force the these conservative policies onto people even even under a democratic presidency and i think really like um you know i've been i've been i've been paying attention to politics really for like almost 10 years now i decided i wanted to be a communist in 2013 um at the time like there really weren't any organizations that i knew of and um you know, over the years, like uh, a lot of my friends have just been like liberal progressives. Some of them have ended up becoming um, uh, communist aligned people. Um, but really like this is the most um, sort of opposed to the Democrats that I've ever seen like my my liberal progressive friends. Like this is the the closest that I've seen a lot of them come to just breaking with the, the system entirely. And I think as much as we can, we ought to capitalize on that because the Republicans are basically uh, waging a war on women and queer people and black people and immigrants, just uh, just all, all their targets, like every, everyone that they, they want to hit they're doing everything that they can to make things as uncomfortable as possible for them, if not outright killing them. Um, they're and, doing a fascism. Yeah, exactly. And, and that, you know that once they once they get power again, if, if they get Trump back in office or if they get someone someone else, someone worse, um, they're not going to hand power back. Like they they already, um, as we saw with the most recent election, like they they aren't going to accept the results. Um, they'll do everything within their means, including illegal or um, uh, corrupt, immoral, whatever you want. Whatever they'll you want. Just to say make that, it legal. They'll just make it legal to yeah. not certify um, election results. It was like, nah, we don't, we don't recognize this as valid because of reasons. So, so I see, I see fascism as like imminent. Like very, very soon, we will have like a fully fascist state. I think, yeah, and that's <laughs> it's fucking scary. And and like, what are the Democrats doing about it? Fuck all, right? So I think um, I think people are a lot more open to, uh, to thinking about alternatives now than they have been in a long time. And uh, we definitely should do what we can to uh, um, use that uh, as much as we can. Absolutely. In other news, I'm having Cracker Barrel for dinner. That sounds tasty. Have you thought about what you want to eat? I've already, I'm already eating it. I had a hamburger and chicken dinners because I got the five year old. <laughs> hey, I mean, eat what you want. Like, 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 don't let anyone judge you. Yeah. Right. It's, it's just fuel for revolution. <laughs> it's like there's, there's so few joys in life as it is. Like, you can take a little joy eating like a five year old. Like, do it. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. I don't like peas. Well, you you don't have to you don't have to eat peas. <laughs> you know George Bush's dad banned broccoli from the White House. Really, I've never heard that. Why? Before. Because when I was a kid, my mother used to make me eat it. And now that I'm president of the United States and a grown man, I don't have to eat any more broccoli. That's what he said. It won't even be in my house, <laughs> my very white house. Broccoli is super good, though. We should do an episode just dedicated to the fucking insane shits that presidents have done in the White House. I, I, I thought you were going to say do an episode based on uh, how delicious broccoli is and ways to prepare it. Yeah, there's a lot of good ways. See, most people don't like vegetables because when they were growing up, all their parents did was boil it. Just, oh, so many, uh, yeah. But there's so many good ways that you can prepare vegetables. You can grill them. You got to use the seasoning, but there's so many good ways you can prepare vegetables. Ask any Indian or uh, Asian person or African person or anybody that's not European or American. They know how to do vegetables. <sighs> For most of them, I really, I really want to try fufu. African mashed potatoes. I'm just kidding, but that's literally what it looks like. Uh, yeah, it's it's like doughy though, isn't yeah. it? Yeah, it is. It's, it's uh, made with cassava, and uh, it's like 
they really love like peanuts over there. And like you just take it and that's how you eat it. You got to dip it in the soup or the sauce or whatever. It's like a right, sauce. right, right. And if you just eat it by itself, it's like it's bland. It's plain. But yeah, it's right. Big, that's how that's how, that's how I always see yeah, it. Like basically eat. a giant lump. You always like you always get a big old big old glob of it, and then like basically grab a just a a good amount of like whatever like stew or whatever it is i'm not too familiar with african cuisine which uh, regrettably so there's a few places around here that i'd like to try don't try it you only live once <clears throat> all right let's see what else we have to talk about so question um a comrade of ours recently said that they believe that the left in the United States is a, uh, is a bit of a joke. What would give someone that impression? Like, just looking at the state of the left in the United States, like, what would give somebody the impression that, oh, these people are not serious, they're full of shit, and they're even dangerous, some of them. So why would some people, like, why would they come to that conclusion? Like, what experiences would lead somebody to believe that the left is a joke? Uh, I mean, I mean, what left? <laughs> Like, where, where's the left? Uh, I look around, like, I see a bunch of, like, scattered fucking individuals, but, like, the left doesn't really exist at this point. Maybe you should look to your left. What do you see when you look to your left? A wall? Uh, I mean, I've got a little end table with some books on it. No. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, like, I think the main thing that that would convince people, especially people that come from countries where there's a real vibrant left, like the Philippines or Nepal or India, like they look around there, like you could go somewhere, hey, this is where the demonstration is going to be this day. Uh, this is where you can go to find the comrades. In the United States, it's just like, it's an arbitrary, like, oh, we should do something about this. Let's do a banner drop. And then they never do it, right? Or... Well, I mean... It has to do with, like, the context of America. Everything's an aesthetic, right? It's, uh, your political participation can be relegated to, like, posting or shit like that, or just assuming an aesthetic. Yeah, buying a bunch of patches to put on a jacket, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. But if you don't back that up, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. Like, you're, you aren't a threat. It's, like, I've always thought of, like, leftism, right? They call, they call, it, they call it leftism. They, whoever they are. Uh, they call it leftism, but it's just a, it's a, it's a recuperation. It's, it's just, uh, there's no, like, ideological rigor to it to, like, uh, actually give it substance it's shallow yeah like you can literally buy a t-shirt with uh Che Guevara's face yeah in it. exactly don't don't uh express yourself politically through action express it through consumption yeah play play Tropico and do communism on there. Do that way. anyway. That's fun, but that's not doing politics. Like being on Reddit is not doing politics. No. Like shouting, shouting at people online about, uh, like especially like fascists, like talking to people who are clearly fascists online. That does nothing. Like, you have to organize like in real life in your workplaces and like where you live don't shout on people on the internet shout at people in real life your landlord or fucking your boss or whoever is your talking you over but shout your comrades be sure be sure not to do it alone because that's the point shout at your comrades yeah 
<laughs> Actually, don't. you're a good man when I shout at you, so I don't do that. No, don't, don't shout at me. You haven't given me reason to. <laughs> well, yeah, the left is a joke because it's commoditized. It's uh, a... <clears throat> it's it, doesn't, it doesn't exist, really. No. What, like, impetus is there for it to exist, right? Like, I mean, we have exploited people, though. Right. But they're also, like, the... There's also the ideological, I think the ideological component of like how people are bombarded with uh, bourgeois ideology is the most important thing here. Like it's, it's everywhere. Our entire, our entire culture is, is based upon consumption and like how you consume things, what media you consume, what you wear, like, like that is, that is the choice that has been given to us, like, when, like, a lot of the, uh, uh, contradictions among, like, European people and, uh, the capitalists was, like, like, exported. Like, during the New Deal, like, FDR was a fascist. He fucking centralized control over an eco- of an economy. Like, he merged a corporate and, and, and state entity, essentially. And ironically, he's one of my favorite presidents. <laughs> oh, what penance do I have to do for that? I don't know. But, like... That's like that's where like the prosperity that that comes at the end of World War II is at the cost of the fucking periphery, the the, the global South, like in Asia and Latin America. Like that's where the suffering was exported to. And then the stuff at home is just uh uh it has to be justified through an ideological component. Like, if you're fucking homeless, it's your fault. Or if you're an addict, it's it's all your fault. It's only your individual choices that have led you to where you are. There, Like, outside stimuli doesn't exist. People exist in a vacuum. Ridiculousness. You know, Rook, I had the, like, <clears throat> creeping hunch that you would be really good at this, and my hunch was not wrong. Thank you. Mm Mm-hmm. You too, Fish. So, let's see what else we have. So, what is the role of social media in organizing, if any? Because the title of this this, uh, inaugural episode is going to be Please, for the love of Mao, organize. So Mm -hmm. what's the role of social media in organizing, like, if any? Like, what purpose does it have? Now, keep in mind that we are in the 21st century, right? And most people get their politics from where? Memes, TikToks, uh, Instagram, Twitter. Yeah, I mean, ultimately, it's going to be... The, the role of social media is going to be distribution of uh, propaganda. Well, yeah, I, I, I kind of see it like, you know, the printing press, you know, or television. It's like um, right. there's it, – it, it, it's an innovation in, in communication infrastructure, right? So, of course, there's like a bunch of stupid shit and like people just like – uh, trolling each other back and forth like endlessly like really all it is is just a way for people to communicate uh, semi-anonymously with each other so um, it, it, you know it's not it's not so much social media that is the problem necessarily uh, so much as just kind of like human behavior itself now I would say that like Twitter and Facebook the way their algorithms work um, contribute to this uh like toxic atmosphere in terms of like um the uh tweets posts whatever that that get like pushed to the top 
you know, they're like the most controversial, the ones that are most, uh, most going to fire up discussion. And the more people um, comment back and forth with each other, the, the, the more traction it gets. Um, but I think in general, it's just like that. That's this is how people communicate now. And we can't really expect to go back from it. Um, now, I think that in terms of like communist content, in terms of like um, how can you use social media to further the revolution, I think really that can only be done on a uh, an organizational level. Um, you know, I think I think like the individual the individual like um, uh, memeing and, and and joking and and you know, the 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 take economy. Uh, I don't think that really contributes to much. Um, I think, you know, left book in general is a, is a failure. And, and, and I say that having gotten a lot of my politics from Facebook and Reddit early on. Um, but I think in terms of like, how, how can we influence people? How can we get people to actually go out and do something and not just um, talk online endlessly about it? It has to be done from, from an organizational level, like in terms of um, this is this is the organization's stance. You know, this is um, uh, you know political education um, suggestion by by this organization. I think that uh, in terms of actually like changing people's minds, ch changing like communist sympathizers' minds and getting them to get active, um, it has to be done through. Um, collective means um, in order to enforce kind of the discipline that has to be taken with social media. Oh, very good point, Fish. Rook, do you have anything else to add? No, I think that was pretty succinct. Yeah, it's just, uh, it's it's going to be a means with which to uh, connect to people. It's not like you cannot organize people online. That is not. Sure, you can. You can organize people online, but those people probably end up being feds or flakes. <laughs> yeah, of course. But I. That's that's what I'm saying. Like, like the internet is is alienating, uh, in in a way, just because of how how it's used in capitalist society there's this tendency to make it as alienating as possible like when people are shouting at each other in a in, in a in a fucking message thread like they're not actually having a conversation like it's it's a it's there's this weird disconnect and it it's it's very uh i think it's very like unpersonal you know what i mean yeah that's why I like people i see people say some fucked up horrible shit to each other on the internet yeah but they were like i've seen them telling people to under fucking uh, uh harm themselves like go jump in a fucking lake like why would you say that to a person that's me over More like anti-social media yeah over what a stupid ass <laughs> argument got him. And I've never seen anybody convinced in any of these these uh, shouting back and forth matches. It's like uh, trench warfare in World War One. Like, okay, you're over here, you're over here, shoot at each other. Like, you never gain any ground. You never do anything. All you have is uh, like I've seen people get get into it with people that they've known for years, and uh, and fucking. And, and then becomes worse. Ruin, just ruin relationships <laughs> over a stupid fucking post. Yeah, the, yeah. Make I've seen people make make uh, make divorces, everything on social media over dumb shit. No, I think you know a lot of it is trivial, um, and a lot of people aren't open to learning. But there there are exceptions. I mean, I myself like a lot of a lot of what I learned early on about feminism about like trans stuff was because I said some ignorant shit and got called out on it you know and I didn't I wasn't uh receptive to the the lesson in the moment I was like man all these people are like pissed off at me and that sucks and I don't like this but you know um walking away from it it's like damn like there's a lot of this that I just I, I hadn't really thought through before and I don't know that I believe my position 
um, has the most evidence to support it. Like, um, I, I think that there is, I don't want to, I don't want to say that it can be used for like revolutionary ends per se. A lot of it is just like random <laughs> in terms of like what people are willing to learn in a given moment. Um, but I, I think that it's not, it's not necessarily entirely trivial. Like I said, I think it's mostly just, it's, it's people communicating with the, with the veil of anonymity between them. Um, and while a lot of that is entirely unproductive, you know, there, there are times that it is productive in some way or another. Do we, do we agree that Italians are undeserving of respect on the internet? <laughs> No, I'm serious. Do we or do Italians deserve respect on the internet? I I, I can't say that I'm uh, I'm partisan to either side of the debate. I'm ambivalent on the Italian question. <laughs> uh, what about so so? Are we talking about Italian nationals or Italian Americans? Italian Americans. Okay, well that that's that's a very different thing. I should have led with that. So should we respect Tony Soprano? I mean, I mean I, he is a sociopath. Yeah, he's not a very nice guy. I probably wouldn't disrespect him just because I value my life. <laughs> right. Did you hear what this fucking fish said to me? <laughs> Don't you ever fucking disrespect me again. <laughs> <laughs> I just finished rewatching that series. I, I I still haven't seen it. Um, my dad was really into it, but I I never watched it. Yeah. Yeah, I started watching it. It's it. I want to like keep watching it, but it seems like a series that would depress me. Yeah, it's a lot just of like of if I watched a bunch of it at once. Um, Tony probably wouldn't like you very much, Rook. We could bond over our love of ducks. Yeah. But yeah, he probably wouldn't like the queer, the queer commie. Yeah. You'd be skinny Vito. Anyways. Uh, <clears throat> so we've been at this for about an hour. Um, are we done? Or do you all have any other roasts that you want to put on me? <laughs> I, guess, I guess what I'd want to end with is I think there's a, a, a war on women going on right now. Um, I think I think it's very serious um, the the threat of fascism that is uh, just looming over us, and I think that every second that we take now to prepare before it really um, before it really closes in on us, um, it, it could it could be life saving not just to ourselves but to thousands or millions of other people as well. So yeah, uh, get organized and prepare for some some really really awful things that are gonna happen in the near future uh so you know not to be a downer or anything but <laughs> yeah uh, a politician just lead off with get ready for some very bad things to happen in the future brace yourselves like it's the fucking time of monsters yeah. like when people like we need to get out in front of this because it's it's gonna happen. Oh, we're already behind. Oh yeah, no, that's the thing. That's the thing. We're way behind. You know, getting out in front, we're already behind, buddy. I just had. Uh, yeah, what a nightmare. Get organized, please. If 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 you have family members or friends telling you like, hey, it's really bad. Hey, I'm telling you. I'm telling you. Hey, it's really bad. <clears throat> you should uh you should get organized. You should start doing like study about ideological stuff. You know, that way there's like some sort of discipline. Because you already have ideology. You've internalized fucking bourgeois horse shit. And you should unlearn that. It's it's really hard and uh uh the the, the birthing of a of of someone who is maybe oppressed or perhaps 
uh, an oppressor into someone who seeks liberation is a very, very painful one sometimes. But it's it's that, or uh, you might see people you love die. Uh, you know, like you'll do that regardless. But it might be in terrible fucking ways. Navar Margulis. Yes, yes. Uh, I I can't remember the nerd stuff. Valar Doheris. Yeah, that's the one. What is that, <coughs> Valyrian? I think that's what all men must work. All men must die. <laughs> all except, men must this work. Goes. Except you all two men are, must serve, right? Valar Doheris is all men must serve, and Valar... Serve. Okay, before George R. R. Martin sues us. <laughs> Good thing I'm an NB. Yeah, yeah. Um, so so gonna, we all agree that things are very, very bad, and like we should probably do something about it. Uh, no, please things are good. Fucking, things, please we, fucking we organize. To, we don't have to do anything. Things are good. They've never been better. I mean, yeah, for a lot of people. I mean, pretty much. What's What's different for a lot of people? <laughs> it's like wonderful. It's like <laughs> what, like what, like what are you willing to accept? Right, like. Are you really going to sit by while uh, 10-year-olds from Ohio have to cross state lines to get an abortion? 10-year-olds? Like, yeah, that's a thing that happened. Jesus. That thi- yeah. Holy fuck. I'll, I'll, share, I'll share the story with you later. Yeah, Please it's don't. It's fucking awful. I don't want to read about that stuff. Exactly. 10-year-old girl need abortion? Yeah. And she had to fucking cross state lines because Indiana had some stupid fuck trigger law, right? What sick fuck it, got a 10-year-old pregnant? Fucking... Oh, Jesus. It, it just... It happens. Yeah. It, that's the worst fucking part. It happens. What? what oh, my like, God. Yeah. That's so, right. like, that's why, the, that's why the fucking right to bodily autonomy is a fucking thing that should be demanded. Like... Well, and- yeah, it, it, and, the right, and the right to castration of whoever the fuck gets a 10-year-old pregnant. Exactly. Oh, my God. But no, that's, ruined, like, like, that's the fucking consequence of this. You've ruined my day. Women, women are going to die. 10-year-old fucking little girl. Yeah. She's not and even like, a that's, and, are, and, like, that's the thing. Are you going to get organized or are you going to continue to let this happen? I'm going to throw up. <laughs> Sorry to ruin your dinner. Oh my God. But yeah, the world is fucking terrible. 10 year old girl. Oh. But there, there, there are things that we can do about it. As much as we can do, we should do. Exactly. It, not all is lost. All right, so you, can, you have you have the power to change things. So I don't think our fans would want us to end with a ten year old girl being raped and needing an abortion. So let's end with something positive, yes? Absolutely. Let's go ahead. Think of something positive. Uh, well, you know. Uh couple of fucking we can we can we it's possible a better world is possible that's the positive i didn't say platitude (laughs) (laughs) a better world is possible yeah it's pretty fucking cliche it's bad you see written up on a fucking planet fitness do better i keep just thinking of ducks ducks (laughs) yeah i just keep thinking of fish like Ducks are very good. There's something say one unknown fact that most people do not know about ducks. Uh, okay. Uh, males and females sound different. Really? They make they make different quacking noises. Really? Males are like quieter and raspy, and then females make the classic quack noise. So what? The males are like quack 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 over the guy. Yeah. Not exactly. You uh, sound like Donald Duck. Actually, kind of. The 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 
the sound is called squack. It's a it's a uh, it's a raspy kind of sound. Huh. I will look that up. Yeah. All right. Very good. Well, that ends our novel episode, everybody. Enjoy your evening. And don't meditate on bad, disgusting images. Good night.